So, hi everyone. Give us a little wave here. And I want to say um, global forest link greetings to everyone who is participating live today. And we welcome those who are listening to our on-demand playback session as this webinar is being recorded. My name is Dr. Yvonne Marie Andres. I'm the co-founder of Global Schoolnet, and I'm the education and outreach director for Global Forest Link. The purpose of Global Forest Link is to connect youth locally and globally to collaboratively investigate forest change and share their observations through digital stories. So it is my great pleasure to welcome you to a special Meet the Expert webinar today with Dan Bennett, who is the founder of Children's Film Festival Company. Also joining us is the Global Forest Link director, Elena Yulova, and uh, Rose Hanscom and students from Francis Park, a school in San Diego. Dan, before you start your presentation, would you give us a little bit more information about your exciting background? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm happy to hear that someone thinks it's exciting, <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. So my long-term background is as a reporter for daily newspapers and magazines, um, studied journalism at San Diego State, and then worked for several daily newspapers um, in San Diego County, and then wrote uh, for the Los Angeles Times, some freelance correspondent reporting, and for Entertainment Weekly, and some others. And then... Um, about 15 years ago, uh, after my daughter was born, actually, um, I started. What I should go back. I, I wrote a lot about film in my um, in my journalism career. And um, about 15 years ago, uh, when I had kids, I started thinking, you know, what kind of uh, films and stories do I want them to see? Sometimes it's movies that come out of Hollywood, but some, a lot of times it's not. So. Uh, I decided to start the Children's Film Festival both in Los Angeles and San Diego, and we're having our, uh, our uh, I think it's the 14th, maybe the, thir uh, the 13th LA Festival this weekend, actually. And we show short films from around the world. We do workshops, and we're really proud that more than 20 of our uh, filmmakers whose films we showed when they were uh, either in high school or their university thesis films, um, they've gone on to win Oscars as part of Oscar winning teams. So we're excited about that. So that'll, th we're hoping that happens this, this weekend where we see some talent that's gonna be uh, that. So I started to think about how storytelling matched um, both in, in journalism and in um, uh, film and even animation, not so much the content because one is fiction, one's nonfiction and you have to, to make the difference and you have to make clear that difference. But as far as the structure and technique, um, they, they kind of borrow from each other. So yeah, so with that, um, we can go ahead. All right, so um, what I'm gonna do is do a screen share now, and we're going to move on to uh, Dan's uh, presentation. And by the way, you'll have time for questions. I'm sure um, a lot of things he says well, you'll find very interesting, and you'll probably have some questions. So please jot those, those down, and we'll have some time for some Q&A. I am going to do a screen share, and I'm going to say share screen, and let's see, we'll go right here, and do, okay, and let's see if we can move our faces out of the way here. All right, everybody can see the um, presentation? Just shake your head yes. If you yes. Don't. Okay, all right. All right, Dan, turning it over to you. Okay, so yeah, like I said, I, I know that uh, with your projects, you're, you're working on evidence-based storytelling. And so what I'd like to do today is, is kind of uh, talk about story craft and structure and how we can learn from, uh, from even uh, popular uh, fiction, the structure of uh, storytelling while also using evidence-based journalism. Um, making sure our facts are there, just using the structure. So next slide. All right. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so there are, um, there are storytelling experts everywhere, and, and it, it, that's a good thing, because they each have different perspectives. Here's just a couple of quotes about narratives being another word, uh, essentially, for storytelling. Um, how they afford meaning to our lives. And then I like the second one, storytelling could be an evolutionary mechanism that helped 
keep our ancestors alive. So stories, people passing on stories about where food was, where shelter was, um, that, that could be uh, applied to this. And even stories about the environment or maybe the, the uh, videos that you're all, you all are working on um, have some element, element of uh, some environmental aspect um, that, uh, you know, helps, helps keep, uh, keep us healthy and, and perhaps long-term alive. So next slide. So this is a journalist flow chart, which applies, um, it's made for print, but this can actually be applied to video or any kind of uh, uh, storytelling flow. So it's a basic journalist flow chart, flow chart where you have an idea, usually that would be the, the news, or in your case, you have uh, ideas for, for I, I think what you call news features. Um, you go out and do the reporting, you ask people questions, um, get all the facts, you write, then you edit, and um, best case, you have someone else edit for you because sometimes you don't see everything you need to see. Then you make your revisions, and then you publish. So that's a, that's a basic flow chart. Okay, next. And again, this is story maps. We all know about who, what, why, where, when, and it's still true as much as it ever was. All these elements have to be involved. The why is usually the, the most challenging part. And it says down there below, why is there a conflict? So this, a lot of the stories that we write or a record for video, uh, there is some kind of conflict either between people or people in nature or, or, or some kind uh, or political or cultural. There is usually a, 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 often a conflict, especially in bigger stories. So when, when, you're, when you're writing or, or taping, uh, think about the five W's because they're, even though they may sound simple, they, they, they really are true. Okay, next. So, um, Okay, so this is the inverted pyramid. This is two. This is just two ways of looking at it. So we're in journalism school. We learn about the inverted pyramid of writing, and um, <laughs> so basically, it's it's an upside down pyramid. And so you, the most important information leads the story, uh, then subsequent facts, and then the least important information closes the story. However, when you're writing a feature or or videotaping a, a feature, often the it's not the least important information. It's, it's uh, more the, the human impact. And the, usually you, you might end with a quote at the end if it's a, a feature or, or a, a documentary um, to kind of leave people with, you know, with some emotional resonance. And then the one on the right, and, and you can look at these later too, just kind of um, gets into that in, in more detail. Um, and you can see on the top on the right pyramid, the most critical information, the when, where, why, and how. Okay, next slide. So this is just, I thought you might find this interesting. So I think maybe um, the majority of people, this, so this is a, how, how people of different age groups, demographics are getting their news today. So um, I think most of the people listening now are, are maybe below the 18 and 29, but close to the 18. So you can see that how things have changed. Um, you know, and some of us were, were that age, uh, we got most of our information from print and, and TV, but now you see 50% of the 18 to 29 demographic uh, gets their information from websites, apps, and social media. And, um, and then print is way down there. So most of you have probably heard that print newspapers are, are slowly disappearing um, for a lot of reasons, uh, having to do mostly with, with the internet. And uh, so it's, that's affected me. It's affected a lot of people I know over the years. But it's also the way it is. And so um, all of us are having to adapt as these things change. And there's both good and good and bad about the fact that people are getting their information from websites and social media. But that'll be a discussion for another time. So, um, okay, next. So in your work, whether it's written journalism or, or uh, uh, documentary video, um, you, you want to have data um, because numbers su support uh, what, what you're saying, the, the facts you're trying to prove, the thesis you're trying to prove. And so you, it's okay to use graphs and charts and maps and all these things because this is what uh, supports the information. Um, that said, go ahead into the next slide. Okay, so, well, let me say this first. So um, using data, um, this is kind of a, a different form of the inverted, inverted pyramid, um, how you take the information you have, the numbers, you filter them, what really matters and what doesn't, make, and also make sure they're accurate. Then you visualize how those look to people who are watching your video or reading your story, 
and, um, and, and figure out what's the best way to tell that story, and then that turns into the story. Okay, next. Um, so here's a, here's a chart. So mean global temperatures, historical and projected over, um, uh, it's like a, a long, long time. So you can see how the, the, um, the gray goes up and how the projected uh, global temperature is expected to change in, in the coming years. So your job, so when you first look at this, you might be intimidated by it. And this one isn't too complicated, but a lot of uh, charts are. And it's just a matter of, of working it out and figuring out how to turn it into words or turning it into visuals. So um, don't be afraid to use data because it's important. It's just, uh, it's, it, it's just usually a supplement for the human interest of the piece. Okay, next. Okay, now we're going to watch a short video on story. Were you able to get this, Yvonne? Yeah, so let me um, quit out of here and go to uh, my... Sorry, i got to move some of these things around here. I'll go to here. And it is... We're talking about Pixar one, right? No, the other one. The other one. Okay, persuasion. There we go. And we're going to start... Once upon a time, information was scarce, so we made decisions based on the advice of experts, using them as North Stars for insights. Now, thanks to the internet, we can ourselves try and find our own answers to questions that plague us and find information to make informed decisions. But instead of finding clear answers, we often find noise. We're living in a world where we have too much information, and because of that, we're even more susceptible to great story. It's what helps us decide what to believe in. Stories are important because they're meaningful, and they're meaningful because they're memorable, impactful, and they personally connect. First, let's talk about memorability. Eugene O'Kelly was a CEO of a consulting company. He started having headaches. He was referred to a top neurosurgeon in New York where he was diagnosed with late stage brain cancer. He was given three months to live. He started talking to his wife, how does he want to spend those 100 days? He was purposeful about who he spent time with and what stories to share with them. He also thought hard about what would be remembered in those last 100 days. He and his wife would live each day with a focus on finding perfect moments where time expands and when noise is separated from signal. All that exists is that single moment. And he found in those perfect moments, those were the most memorable stories that defined his life. In one study, researchers asked students to make a one-minute persuasive pitch to other members in their class. And on average, a typical student used 2.5 statistics in their pitch. Only one in 10 told a story. 10 minutes later, the researcher asked everyone to pull out a sheet of paper and write down every single idea they remembered. Only 5% remembered any statistic. 63% of students remembered the story. Stories are memorable in a way that statistics aren't. Now let me talk about impact. Research shows that individuals are more likely to buy from a person or an organization whose story they believe in and which resonates with them. In one study, Deb Small at the University of Pennsylvania and her colleagues wanted to determine how to best raise money for Save the Children, a charity focused on the well-being of children worldwide. They created two versions of a marketing pamphlet. The first version featured statistics about the magnitude of problems facing children in Africa. The second version also featured those statistics, but in addition provided information about Rokia, a seven-year-old girl from Mali, who faced the threat of severe hunger. The subjects were given $5 as compensation for the study, and before leaving, the researchers asked if they wanted to donate any money to the cause. The individuals in the story commission gave nearly twice as much money as those in the statistics commission. We used to think it was our rational brain that makes decisions. Now we know it's emotion driving decisions and we rationalize the decision afterwards. Finally, I want to talk about personal connection. Research shows that if we present statistics to an audience, a certain part of the brain called the Broca's and Barenkees area gets activated. So the language processing part of the brain is activated and we can understand but not feel. When the story is shared, the audience feels the story. Our whole brain is activated and meaning is extracted. The meaning of the story comes from the personal connection the audience feels when they're listening to the story. 
And when a story is well told, they're able to feel connected not just to the story, but to the storyteller. When most of us think of advocating for ideas, we go to statistics, we go to convincing arguments, facts, and figures. But studies show that if we share a story, people are more likely to remember the message, be persuaded by it, feel personally connected to it. And when data and stories are used together, audiences are moved both intellectually and emotionally. For lasting effect, you need to persuade the rational brain, but also resonate with the emotional brain. Recent behavioral research has shown why stories are so powerful. It's because they're meaningful. Those who tell the best stories will become the best leaders. If we consider the simple question, what is the story or why am I doing this? We may find we make very different choices of how we spend our time. Isabella Allende once wrote, silence before being born, silence after death. Life is nothing but noise between those two unfathomable silences. But there is signal and there is noise. And how do we reduce the noise? The story. Okay, so uh, there's, are we, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, so there's, there's a, um, a, a short video about um, how to, to mix um, data with story. And again, to emphasize what the narrator said and, and what I was talking about earlier, data and statistics are extremely important in supporting viewpoints because you can't just quote someone on something if there's data to prove otherwise you have to report that and um it, it just it supplements i mean it does more than supplement the story it supports the story so they they go together so the the point being that get those numbers and then find a way to tell the story in a human way okay so now we're gonna i'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk so i mentioned the the film festivals and as we all know um pixar is one of the best at at telling stories for the last decade or so um, so you see that quote from from Andrew Stanton, one of the Pixar directors, um, that telling talking about how how stories uh, give us a better understanding of who who we are as human beings. So next one, Yvonne. Um, I'm not sure we have time to do this. Uh, this other one's five minutes also. So I'm thinking maybe you can give them the link and they can watch this one later. Um, but this is kind of a, a Pixar's exploration of finding story ideas. Okay, next one. So here's a basic uh, story structure. So now, so for your videos, if you if you're doing video, even though this is Pixar, you know, with obviously an animated fictional story, the, the uh, structure, um, uh, it's a good solid structure that you could use with setup, um, an act one plot point um, where the the uh, protagonist meets the antagonist, um, and this could be two people or it could be uh, a lot of different things again different cultures or political viewpoints um, you have opposite sides um, the midpoint comes when the protagonist is forced into the antagonist world and basically has to escape um, the act two plot point where things get really bad and then the ending where things get better okay next one and then we're not going to go through all these, but these are good storytelling tips that, again, apply to all types of storytelling. I, um, I kind of like number five, what is your character good at and comfortable with, and then put the opposite, throw the opposite at them. That happens a lot in the Pixar. Um, so, again, if you're doing uh, nonfiction, you're limited on this. But for those of you who also are, are working on projects that are that creating animation or, or um or, or short films with characters. Th these are good. These are good points for that. Um, I like also like um, number six, and I hear this over and over again. Come up with your ending before you figure out your middle. And this is true both in uh, in fiction and nonfiction. You can you uh, you usually know what your ending is if it's a true story or what you want the ending to be. So figure out where you're headed first, and then and then go for it. Okay, and then um, yeah. Well, I just want to uh, jump in and say that even though um, their, um, their assignment was to create a story about uh, forest health and, and their observations, they could get very creative and they could do, uh, do it through animation or through fictional characters. It, it doesn't okay. have to be just, you know, kind of a dry report. And over the years that we've been doing this, we've gotten some very creative um, uh, digital stories from students. Okay, great. That that's that's good news. I'm I'm happy to hear you're using all different uh, formats because 
obviously telling a story through through animation or film and fictional characters who are presenting a viewpoint is is really effective. So um, I like number eight too. Putting it on paper lets you start fixing it. That's the hard part, right? Is to get started, but you have to get started and then uh, get, and get it out of your head so you can share it. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Okay, so um, I think maybe you read uh, some work by uh, Joseph Campbell, American philosopher, mythologist, and this is his design of classic storytelling. Um, so you see the, the protagonist at the top um, called to adventure somehow um, uh, in, in some stories receives kind of supernatural aid or, or uh, uh, at least a, a guardian who, who helps them. And if you keep going down, you go to the mentor and then helpers. These, these might be friends. So this, this hero needs help, needs, needs to be taught how to get something done. Then he goes through challenge, he or she goes through challenges and temptations. And then down at the bottom, um, kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, the, the abyss, death and rebirth. This is a metaphor for the most part. Um, about how uh, the hero reaches the lowest point and that experience makes a transformation in that person's character. Um, and then the atonement makes up for mistakes that happened earlier on the journey. And then finally goes back home again, that could be literal or metaphorical. Um, and then arrives back with the, with the story completed. So I wanted to throw out a, a question. Can anybody uh, think of a recent fictional film character who went through a journey like this um well i'll try i'll try that one first and uh uh very popular uh multi-film series i am muted uh, star wars with luke skywalker well yeah, for sure, for sure, Star Wars and Luke, Luke Skywalker. So he, he goes through all these things, you know, really in the original three films. And then they're kind of repeating that now with different characters. How about another one? Um, somebody, especially who uses supernatural aid and uh, has a... Uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, uh, that's another good one. These aren't the ones I'm thinking of, but those those are both good. Um, so so this, let's say, okay. This, let's say, this is a, a teenager who needs the help of a long bearded mentor who <laughs> Harry, Potter. <laughs> there you go. Harry Potter so um so yeah go ahead into the next one and then go and then go back so here they are you remember them well okay go back Yvonne um so yeah if you look at this now and apply it to Harry Potter he went he goes through all these transformations and in fact I think he in the last film he literally dies in and uh, experiences rebirth and goes through transformation, atonement, he makes up for mistakes he made with his friends. And then they all return after uh, defeating the bad guy and, um, and, go, and go full circle. So that's, that, this is a good, so the hero's journey and Campbell's work in general is a good way to structure your story in a, in a classical form. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I always like to throw these magic ingredients. You want to have all these in your story. Um, it's kind of a Harry Potter reference, but uh, be careful with these. Some of them look dangerous. So, <laughs> but they look also very scientific. So <laughs> they do. They do. Yeah. Okay. You can go on. Okay. This is a. So I'm, to close, I'm going to show you three um, storyboard samples. So this is an empty storyboard. So you can just make a print. Of, you can get this online and then use it either with words or with um, pictures to make a storyboard for your video um, or, or other type of project. Okay, go to the next one. So um, I, I know you have more to say about storyboarding, but I'm just curious, um, you can just raise your hands. How many of you used a storyboarding technique to create your digital stories? Just raise your hand if you did. I'm looking, I don't see any hands. So, so yeah, so this is, um, this is a very uh, typical way of creating your a digital story again, whether it's uh, fictional or non-fictional. So this would be a really good thing for you guys to learn. Yeah, it's, it's just a storyboard is a handy tool. It really gives you a, a basically a communications plan to um, to do what you want to do. So here's a little more advanced for for video. So for your videos, you could you could uh, structure this how you like. But this is one sample, and we can get you this if you want to use this. Again, these are different versions are all online. And then the last slide is this is a completed storyboard, which is actually about an assignment to create a storyboard. So it's uh, uh, kind of funny that way. So um, 
this this would be a storyboard that you used for um, for with both pictures and words um, that you could turn into a to a maybe a fictional video project or a, a nonfiction. So different types of storyboards, and I think that's it. Okay, so. I am going to stop sharing and then we're going to do some, have some time for uh, Q&A. So um, students at Francis Parker, what kind of questions do you have for Dan? Hello. Uh, uh, my name is Liam Fay. Uh, I'm a senior here. Hi, Liam. Hello. Hi. Um, and I guess my question is um, in looking at kind of creating stories with the, with the, the, the hero's journey that we looked at. Mm -hmm. How many of those elements, I guess, one, is it common to see skipped? And how, I guess just like, can you skip the elements in creating like a successful hero story? And if so, like, are there any examples that you can think of? Yeah, I think that you, you, you uh, use that diagram and, and Campbell's work as you, as it fits you. So if you don't want to put your uh, hero through a, um, you know, a, a death and a rebirth. If that's too meta, too too metaphorical or or just doesn't isn't practical, you don't want to do that. Um, I guess he doesn't. He or she doesn't really have to have a mentor, but that seems like an important part of a of a learning process to, is to have a mentor. But I, I don't think you need to. If you struggle with one of the pieces, I would say skip it and then maybe come back later and 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 then bounce your ideas off somebody else uh, and see if they if they can think of something to use with that particular piece but no I think you can use it as as you best see fit cool thanks do you have another question sure. okay yeah we have another question <laughs> hello hi so in reference, oh, I'm Ryan, sorry. Ryan. Um, in reference to the plot line and how this occurs in societies all, of the, all over the world, why do you think this happens? What can we learn from human behavior about how isolated societies have all come up with this same similar plot line? Yeah, good question. But I think it's, it's an ancient way of telling a story. So at some point in... Uh, in our uh, in our evolution and our ancestral heritage, um, people without access to anything but but the spoken word um, told stories around campfires or or again going back to that survival aspect of it um, told stories about food and shelter and other things that that keep us alive. So I, I think that it's it's been universal for a long time. We've just found different and maybe easier, but also make more complex ways to tell stories. So I guess we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the simple stories are often the best. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's, it, storytelling is a common universal thing. It's just done in different languages from different viewpoints. Well, thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering about, Oh, sorry. My name is Kieran. Um, I was wondering about the ethics of um, when you're trying to create a story off of some problem in the world and you have to find a hero. Um, if you don't find anybody who's entirely clean, let's say, whatever subject it is, let's say, um, you're talking about human rights issues somewhere, but in order to get stuff done, everybody in, who's involved has had some hand in corruption. How do you ethically try to either include that in a story or how do you address that in a story when your hero, um, the only options for you, how do you choose a hero in that scenario and then how do you sort of include their faults into a story? Yeah, if, a, right. Another good question and a, a, a challenge to do. Um, usually, if you're if you're writing a story about a problem somewhere, let's say in a country where human rights violation, using the example you chose, uh, and, and it appears um, there is no one trying to get to get the people out of the situation or to improve the, the situation for people. Um, but usually, you can go out for if I was writing this 
uh, for magazine, let's say, or newspaper, I could find people outside of that group to talk to human rights activists or people like that. It's really difficult to write a story, you know, with all, there's usually, if you're going to write a story about human rights violations, there is a victim, but, but it's not, not, you know, it's not happening uh, glob globally. People aren't making this happen. So there are people probably trying to help those people on the inside. So you would, you would talk to them. And then really, if you have real good access, you find the people who are being affected and whether it's secretly or not. And this happens sometimes where you get their story out, even though they, they it might be a danger for them to tell it. That happens a lot. So there are some tricky ethical boundaries there. So you, you don't want to put people in danger, but some people will volunteer to be put in danger just to get the story out. Mm -hmm. So um, good question and not, not an easy thing to, to navigate. Thank you. Sure. Any other, other questions? Well, I have a question if you can, if you, if you think of another one, we, we can go back to you. But so um, one of the challenges when you're making a short uh, a film or a digital story, and, and these we ask to uh, keep them in three minutes to get their message across, is to balance the content, the information part of it, the technical part, so that uh, you know the sound and the lighting and the the flow and all of that is is um, is good, and then the creative part. So, um, how do you have any uh, thoughts on how when students are creating these stories? Because what we really want the reason we ask them to create the stories is because what they've experienced and what they've seen and what they've observed, we want them to uh, share that with others with the public because we want future groups of students and and the community to see what they've done and learn from that so we always um hope that there's some call to action so after they observe you know the the condition of the trees or um you know the environmental uh, conditions we want them to tell us what they've learned but we also sort of want there to be a call to action so you know what's the purpose of people even watching the film we want them to learn from it but also then you know take some action whether it's an individual or or for the community so my back to my original question how do they balance getting the information in there and also um, you know uh, create being creative and and making sure all the technical aspects are are covered in well, <laughs> yeah well that's <laughs> That's pretty much your assignment, right? Is to is to do as best as you can with both aspects. So yeah, it is a challenge. And usually on a film, there are people working both sides of that. There's there are the story people and there are the tech people. If you're making it by yourself, you are both. So you need to find a way to balance. So if you use a storytelling technique like we've been talking about with a storyboard, if you create a storyboard, you're pretty well off right there because then you have your um, your tech and your story all built into one. As far as uh, creating a call to action, um, it can be done in different ways in a three minute short. A lot of times you'll do it in frame with information for more information, to, for you to help call this, go visit this website, sign up for this email list. So calls to action are, are pretty easy, but you just wanna make sure you have the right one and not too many to overload people. Usually it's best to have um, maybe a couple calls for action, but just one contact. Uh, person for information or organization. So I would say um, whatever feels best, have someone speak it at the end or have someone or, or show it on a, on a final frame with the contact information. Great. And right. And so as we um, look at these stories, these videos that the students created, um, the things that I'm always looking for is, is there a title screen? Do we even know, you know, what this is all about? Or is it just kind of just jump right into, into the story? And then I always look at the end, you know, are there credits? You know, uh, who, are, who, who, who is it that created the, the, the story or the video and, um, you know, what resources they use. So those are, for, for our project, are very important. Yeah, I, I wonder if anybody knows what, what it's called when uh, a film or a, or a TV show or, or something opens without any kind of credit or, or theme song. There, there's a technical term for it. Does anybody know it? Cold open. Okay, here, go ahead. Is it a cold open? Cold open, right. Well, cold open, cold Yay. open, you just go boom and it starts. So you see that on Saturday Night Live when they, um, 
or starting the the program it's just boom they go right usually a political sketch so that that's a cold open so cold open can i like cold opens they can be very effective it's just boom here's the story you know so, or, you know you, you start with a close-up of someone's face you know from from a black screen to boom there they are in the forest and then they start talking about they start setting up the problem i like cold opens if you don't want to use that if it's not practical then you you can create a title page um, and either put your credits up front or probably for a three minute you put the credits on the back and just do it you could just do again after you do your call for action page then a separate a se separate frame with credits director camera sound whatever it is you probably won't have too many names um, so that uh, you could go either way Great. So I want to throw something out to the students there, Francis Parker. And um, one of the arrangements that we have with Dan is that if we can get some really creative and interesting and entertaining short films, uh, they will be screened at the film festival at Comic-Con uh, in July. So those of you that might be interested in seeing your film screen there, you have until March to, uh, to submit your films to us. Uh, to, to Global Forest Link. And again, you can get very creative. I know uh, some of you done, have done a wonderful job in presenting the evidence or, and telling us the facts. And if you want to get even a little bit more creative based on what you learned today about the storytelling part of it, we'd love to show your films at, at the, at the Comic-Con Film Festival. True, yeah. I think they'd be very well received there. We get a good audience and you'll get some good questions and you'll also learn from other filmmakers. And you get to go and answer questions about your film. Yeah, do a Q&A, yeah. Q&A, yeah, yeah in, in real life. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, um, so uh, we have uh, just a few more minutes. Dan, do you have any students for, or any students, any questions for the students? I, I guess um, I was curious, so I showed the, the graph with the, how people are getting their information. I'm just wondering, just to kind of a general poll on, on how, how the students get most of their information today, particularly um, national or global news, or also local? I, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I get it mostly from the internet and not even like seeking it out on the internet, just like, like unless something, usually if I'm going to, if I'm finding out about news, I find out about social media and then if it's really interesting to me or like really shocking to me, which is more common, uh, then, <laughs> Then I'll then I'll take the next step on the internet and like look it up. Uh, like for example, the uh, like the election in Alabama, I was interested in. So because I heard about it through social media, I then turned on the TV to watch about it. But I wouldn't normally just have the TV on watching news. And I'm asking for your for the information you get on social media. Do you subscribe or follow any any news organizations, or it's just you just happen to run into it? Uh, usually, if I find out about it, it's a uh, like it's because like a friend has shared something uh mm -hmm. if they're if they care about it uh but usually it's kind of that it's word of mouth and then if you're interested enough you look it up right okay good good yeah and it's that you feel you're comfortable you feel like you're getting what you need what you need to find out or do you feel like you're short on information i mean it's difficult to navigate because there's like only so much you can learn about, you know, even if all I was doing was consuming news and like, and that's all I sat down and, and did all day. I still feel like I wouldn't have enough news. Yeah. But I think that I, for the stuff that I'm passionate about, I do feel like the wealth of information is there for me. Should I choose to pursue it? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe around election time, I will, uh, but not 24 seven, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's good. And that's kind of what I was saying earlier that, uh, uh, people sometimes are concerned that social media doesn't um, convey the news properly or at all. But I think I found talking to people that, um, and my experience has been that it's a quicker and easier way to get um, good information. So, so, you know, we've, yeah. we've evolved to that and it's a good thing. So uh, anybody else want to try, uh, anybody else have, a, um, want to say how they get their information? Sure. So I get my information from the BBC. I uh, I actually have like one of those like little Alexa things and uh -huh. like my flash briefing or whatever it's called. It just gives me like the five minutes, whatever is important. Um, and so if I find something that's really interesting from there, then I go like Liam, look it up, uh, learn more about it. 
but I usually get my first information from either that or social media as well. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. And BBC is a good source. How about local news? Anybody, do, do you feel like you, you don't have enough access now to local news? Let's say for one reason, uh, maybe your, your household isn't subscribing to a newspaper or you don't watch local TV news or maybe you do, but do, do you wish you had more access to local news? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're not alone. <laughs> I think we've all kind of felt that. So we get a lot of the national news through social media, like we were talking about, but um, local news, you pretty much need to, to get to find local news sites on through social media. So if you feel like you're not getting that, then you can, you can subscribe through social media to the union tribune or um, to other local newspapers. A lot of the, really smaller uh, newspapers and communities have done well with the change in, in print newspaper. Um, so there are ways to, to subscribe and get local news. Um, TV news is a little different. It's more boom, 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 really quick hits, but um, uh, it's good if you can, if you can access local news through, even if it's through the patch, I don't know if you guys know patch.com, but they have local news sites that are um, particular to your neighborhoods. So, um, yeah, it's it's more it's definitely more of a challenge now to get local news, but I'm sure we all agree that it's important that we know what's going on, not just nationally and globally, but. Um, well, so um, and the recent fires, um, obviously, you needed to be you needed access to local news. So, what did you turn? How did you keep up to date with what was happening with the with the fires? I personally had a bunch of friends on Facebook that were constantly sharing the updates. <clears throat> and that's how I got my news from it, and also from other people um, that were just talking about it. Um, but if I didn't have that, I probably would have sought it out myself um, in some other way. Actually, I, I would to add, it's really a, a problem now because when we had fires, I was trying to find really accurate maps, for instance, life maps, and it was really hard. And um, I think the Google News used to have this uh, capability of getting the local news, but I don't think it's as good as it used to be. Yeah, I know Google, I was looking it up and Google has um, a fire map where it has the uh, terrain in like city regular Google Maps map. And then right. overlaid is like a red square or yeah, which whatever was, is on fire. Yeah. But but it, it was not too useful and it did, didn't update on time, like not real time update. Yeah. All right. I, I have a question to oh, say. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you listen to podcasts and do they play any role in you getting news? Or it's more like instead of reading books? I, I listen to one podcast, but it's uh, about, about like music. So not really where I get my news at all. But I know a lot of people will listen to podcasts and some of them political. And I'll say I'm a big fan of podcasts. I listen to a lot of podcasts. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, sto storytelling through podcast is, is, very, is very good now. All right, so we're just about out of time. So I'd like to just go uh, around to everyone and, and see if there's any final remarks that, that, you, um, that you have. I will say we will be making the slides available to you and the link to the other video that we weren't able to show uh, during the presentation. So Elena, let's start with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm really, um, thank you, Dan, for wonderful, wonderful, um, lecture. Uh, I'm right now, I'm sorry, I had to mute my microphone a lot. Uh, I'm at AGU conference. It's uh, American Geophysical Society conference there are, in New Orleans. There are 21,000 people here. And uh, in comparison to other years, they're really talking a lot about how to communicate science and like through poetry, through films, through everything. So I think it's extremely important to, to do this and extremely important uh, to do it in the way that you were talking about, not just even like numbers, 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 to, uh, so that people cannot relate to them. 
but uh, creating the compelling stories. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. And, um, and Rose, how about you? Do you have any final yes, remarks? Yes, I, I want to thank you very much, too. Uh, I wish that we had had this before we wrote our stories. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we would have gotten a lot more creative. So it's been very helpful to us, and, and we'll carry it over in the future. So thank you. Thank you. And I, and I would be happy to help going forward. Just let me know if you want me to take a look at anything. or um, And I could, I could even show drafts of the unedited films to some filmmakers and get feedback. So whatever you need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And Dan, any final remarks? Oh, no, that's just what actually what I was going to say is that uh, <laughs> consider me available. If, uh, you can find me through Yvonne. And um, I, I'm happy to help with, with this project and your future projects. Thank you. All right. So um, again, thank you all. Um, I learned a lot from this. And as I said, this will be available and you can replay it. And anybody that wants to uh, look at the stories that you submitted and maybe do a little bit of editing or resubmit a story, we'd love to show your, your films at uh, Comic-Con in July. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.